This is Historical Hotties, a podcast where we go through different categories of historical figure and try and figure out which one is the biggest babe. Welcome to Historical Hotties, the show where we excavate the sands of time and try and unearth the hottest mummies. With me, as always, is my forever co-host, Whitney Nelson. And this is a very special episode of Historical Hotties because we have our first guest, Liz Crutchley. Hi! (laughs) And she is a researcher at Penn. So our topic today is going to be computer programmers. Whitney, who is your hottie? All right, so I chose Frank Green. Frank Green was born in Washington, D.C., and then he grew up in St. Louis in the 50s. He was one of the first black students to attend school at Washington University. He then completed his master's degree at Purdue in 1962, after which he did a four-year tour in the U.S. Air Force. He specifically cited when the Soviet satellite Sputnik launched, we felt that we were being attacked from space and there was a big call to science, to teaching science, and the Air Force. So after the Air Force, he did four years. He was the first black cadet to make it through four years at the U.S. Air Force ROTC, uh, and and then he became an Air Force captain. And then he started teaching physical science as soon as he got out of the Air Force. Then he started doing research at Fairchild Semiconductor. He completed his Ph.D., at Santa Clara University in 1970, and then he founded his first business. He was the founder of, I think, four different tech businesses, all of which went public or were sold to bigger companies. One of his biggest businesses and his first business was Technology Development Corporation. But he helped to develop basically the microchips that we all use now, in addition to going into software with several of his companies later on that kind of founded a lot of what Silicon Valley runs on today. He received the Distinguished Engineering Alumni Award, as well as the Black Alumni Achievement Award from Washington University, and an award from Purdue uh, for being an luminary alumni. Uh, And then during his career, he was so successful in technology and venture capital endeavors in the Silicon Valley that he ended up raising about $800 million between his own money and outreach to other successful people in Silicon Valley. And that $80 million he donated towards minority and women-owned businesses. He actually died, I think, in 1991. So that's that's my pick. Uh, Liz, who's your hottie? My hottie is Admiral Grace Hopper. Nice. Yeah, she's she's amazing. Uh, so she was born in uh, 1906, December 9th. She was an admiral in the U.S. Navy. She was known as Amazing Grace for her amazing accomplishments in computer science and in the Navy. She had attended Vassar College, graduated with a degrees in mathematics and physics in 1928, then went on to Yale and completed her PhD in mathematics and mathematical physics. And after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, she decided she wanted to join the Navy. Uh, And she she was an incredibly inquisitive child. She was very successful and very good at math and all that stuff. But after the bombing, she really wanted to join the Navy. At the time, she was an associate professor at Vassar, and she was 34 years old, which was considered too old for enlistment. She was also considered underweight for her height. I believe she was about 15 pounds underweight. Although the Navy said she could still serve as a civilian, she was determined to enlist, so she took a leave of absence from Vassar, Uh, obtained a health waiver, and then enlisted in the U.S. Naval Reserve in December of 1943. And her military career is incredible. Like I said, she was known as uh, Amazing Grace. She served in the Navy for 43 years. But her accomplishments in computer science are just extremely impactful. In her first year in the Navy, Grace worked alongside Howard Aiken, who developed the IBM Automatic Sequence Controlled Calculator, also known as the Mark I. Wow. And it was one of the earliest 
general purpose electromechanical computers. And she was one of the first three programmers on the Mark I. Uh, she later went on to work on the Mark II and Mark III. She actually, in 1945, while she was working on the Mark II, they, uh, she and her colleagues encountered a problem. So they took the computer apart and they found a moth <laughs> in the computer. Uh, wow. And so... Yeah, so even though the term bug was used by engineers to describe mechanical uh, malfunctions, it's thought that she was the first to refer to a computer problem as a bug and to speak of debugging a computer. <laughs> That's amazing. That's great. <laughs> so, yeah, pretty cool. So, uh, just a couple more things. She was one of the first people who really thought that computers would be used by a wider audience. And she was really interested in making computer languages in English. Like she wanted to be able to, instead of using mathematical equations and symbols, she wanted you to be able to use English or English-like phrases to program computers. And so during her work, she actually joined the Eckert Mouchley Computer Corporation, which soon became Remington Rand in Philadelphia. And as a head programmer there, she worked on a bunch of different things, but she developed one of the first computer compilers. And so a compiler basically translates mathematical code into binary code. And then from that, she actually, her team developed the Flowmatic programming language, which was the first programming language to use English-like commands. And then from that, she also developed some other languages or helped develop languages like COBOL, um, which she didn't directly help create, but she consulted on with the conference on data systems languages in 1959. So she was really one of the first people who really wanted people to be able to use English and, and thought about how computers would be used by a wider audience at a certain point. And that was even the case in 1959 because people in doing business-related programming, they weren't comfortable with mathematic uh, notation at that <laughs> point in time. So her achievements in that realm were extremely important for basically modern-day programming. Uh, you know, you have if-else statements that that wouldn't be possible without her work. Uh, she was also, like I said, an amazing military person. She consistently called back into active service for many, many years. Uh, she would retire and they would call her back and she would retire and they would call her back. So she had a really amazing career in the military. She, ha she has so many achievements. She was, f I think, 40-something achievements. She uh, was in 2016, 2016, she was awarded uh, posthumously, of course, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Obama awarded that to her. Yeah, she was really incredible. So. Nice. Yeah, you gotta love how after not letting her tell her she's too old to be in the military, then they kept not letting her <laughs> retire. She was extremely persistent. She was very tenacious. Um, I, I don't think I said this, but when she was a child, uh, she took apart seven alarm clocks just to see how they worked. So. <laughs> and then she wasn't allowed to have alarm clocks after that. <laughs> well, you know, that's what happens yeah. when you take apart your stuff. So, wow, this is a very impressive crowd. So my hottie is Augusta Ada King, Countess of Lovelace. Ah, of course. <laughs> uh-huh. People would be very mad at us if we went through a whole programmer's episode without yeah. Ada Lovelace yep. involved. <laughs> Yeah, you got to mention her, often referred to as the world's first computer programmer. She was born in December of 1815, and her parents were Lord Byron and Countess Annabella Milbank, and they had a very turbulent relationship. It did not work out super well. They were only married for about a year before Byron suggested that she take their baby, Augusta, who he called Ada, back to England. They were in Sweden, I think, at the time, for a little bit until they got stuff sorted out, and then he literally never saw them again. He actually even never came back to England again. <laughs> they had a divorce, which was pretty, Whoa. yeah, pretty rare for the time, <laughs> but these early events really shaped the person that Ada would become because not only was she scandalous literally from like 
the day she was born, all of Victorian English society knew about her and the scandal of her parents' marriage when she was just a baby. So she kind of grew up under that sort of celebrity scandal pressure. But also because her mother was so hurt and mad at Byron and was worried that his sort of emotional romantic insanity would be present in Ada, that she encouraged her to study math and science, which was pretty unusual for the time, and even gave her a succession of truly amazing tutors to study it and always encouraged her to focus on that because she thought it would help tamp down the madness that came from her father's side. Didn't ever let her read any of his poetry until she was older. Never even showed her a picture of Byron until she turned 20. She had a weird relationship with her mom. Her mom didn't actually do much of the raising of her. Her grandmother did, and they had a very close relationship. But because at the time laws were sort of in favor of the husbands getting custody of the kids, she had to constantly demonstrate care of Ada. So she sent all these letters inquiring about her health and her education and everything to her m- to her mother, Ada's grandmother, with cover letters that say, keep these in case we need to demonstrate concern later. (laughs) Whoa. Her mother also had friends constantly spy on her to make sure that she was staying moral and upright and not reading poetry. (laughs) But she couldn't help it. She read poetry anyways. It was quite a romantic person. Uh, But she loved machines and mechanics and mechanization. She got obsessed with the idea of flying. She had a lot of illnesses as a kid. And she spent three years where she was mostly bedridden, building wings and studying bird flight and wrote a whole book called Flyology with illustrations and plates with some of her flying machine ideas and stuff like that. So when her science career really started to develop was when she was 17, she went to Charles Babbage's Saturday Salon, which he had every Saturday in London that was full of intellectuals and luminaries at the time. And he talked to her a little bit about the difference machine, which he was working on at the time, to take calculation out of human hands. Because at the time, computers were humans who sat down and did figures, and the way they tested any problems This was coming up mostly when they were looking at astronomy and astronomical relations. They would hand the information to two separate computers, have them both independently work out the problem, and then they would look at them, and if there were differences, then they figured there was a problem with the equation, and if they came out the same, they figured the equation was solid. And he was so frustrated by how often there were inconsistencies in the math that he said, oh, I wish steam could do mathematics, (laughs) which was sort of a catch-all phrase for, like, mechanization at the time. And he was talking to Ada and her mother about this. Ada was so interested that two days after she went to the Saturday soiree, and she was 17 and he was 30 at the time, she wrote him a letter saying, I'm very intrigued by your ideas. Could you send me blueprints? And spent the next several years studying blueprints of his machines and writing him notes about them until he eventually started collaborating with her. (laughs) The reason really why she's called the world's first computer programmer is because later on, after they'd moved on from the difference engine into the uh, analytical machine, which was, he sort of abandoned the difference engine halfway through because he thought the analytical machine would be cooler, even (laughs) though the government of England had already paid him money to develop the difference machine. (laughs) He's like, no, but this will be better. Trust me. Um, And Ada was writing notes on an Italian mathematician's paper in French, for some reason, about Babbage's machine, and she wrote a series of notes that were longer than the original paper on the paper. It was essentially because she couldn't publish a paper on her own at the time, but she could annotate his paper, and it explained the possible uses of the analytical engine and wrote a series of an algorithm, what we would call now an algorithm, a series of Bernoulli numbers that she figured could be run on the analytical engine. Were not run until literally hundreds of years after, but were found to be correct (laughs) when they were, when we finally had a computer that could actually run the Bernoulli sequence that she wrote in the annotated notes of this paper. So that is what people talk about as the first computer program ever written. And that is my hobby. Nice. So let's get into, uh, we'll start with mental attractiveness. I'll start with mine. So Frank Green uh, not only, you know, developed basically memory chips that obviously we've moved far beyond them today, but were kind of the basis, like the launching point for memory 
as we know it today. It was the fastest running memory and the largest memory at the time that we had ever seen. So he also launched the Go Positive Foundation, which offers leadership programs with uh, core positive values for high school and college students. He is quoted as saying, success in life is not about me, but about what you can do to help others. And he was honored as one of the 50 most important African Americans in technology uh, by the Palo Alto City Hall. He also grew up in highly segregated St. Louis in the 50s, where he said, this is a quote from him, making it through life was a civil rights activity in and of itself. (laughs) He organized, when Washington University opened up to people of color, Green said that the top 10 to 15 percent of students from his high school received scholarships. He was in the second class that included black students in the university at all. They went to sit-ins in and around the campus to see if they could integrate some places near the school. And they would just sit there until cops came and closed down the place, basically. So one one time, Frank Green and a bunch of his friends went to a pizza place but the owners there were willing to serve them. (laughs) So it kind of ruined the whole idea of the sit-in because the problem was that between the group of them, no one had enough money for an order. (laughs) So from that day, from that day on, he said, you always have to be prepared for opportunity when it arrives. You've got to be prepared for success. They weren't expecting to succeed with the sit-in, so they didn't take any money with them. And that's kind of the foundation of why he ended up founding so many companies and being so successful, even when he was, you know, fighting as a minority through a tech, honestly, a field that still is not very inclusive. Um, And this was quite some time ago was because he learned early on from this failed sit-in that like if success is ready to be there and you have that opportunity, you have to take it. Um, For my guy, I'm going to give him a five in mental attractiveness. I think this category, especially for these hotties, is going to be... I kind of think everybody gets a five, to be honest. (laughs) I mean, we're we're talking about some really brilliant and creative people. And I think that's one of the things that makes Ada so interesting and what let her leap so far ahead of her scientific contemporaries at the time was the fact that her mother couldn't keep her away from poetry. She was very romantical in nature and she thought the division between science and arts was stupid and counterproductive. She believed in what she called poetic science and that is what allowed her to make the leap that Charlie Babbage didn't see, which was that you could substitute that it didn't only have to be calculations. Her big push forward on the analytical engine was that numbers could represent anything else. Notes, letters, other symbols, and that it could be used to program all kinds of things. She predicted that computers would be able to write musical compositions and play chess and do all of this other stuff that nobody thought they were just basically looking at and trying to come up with a fancy calculator. And so her really big leap and the reason that like Alan Turing cited a direct line from her notes to his work and stuff was that idea that numbers could symbolize a bunch of other things and there wasn't really a limit to what computing could do. Totally. Okay, so uh, just so we're all on the same page, for mental attractiveness, I have already put in fives across the board (laughs) for my vote. So just let me know what everyone else's votes are and I'll fill that in. Yeah, I think that's good. I mean, let me... I, I mean, I think I made a good case for for Absolutely. Uh, Admiral Grace Hopper. She was instrumental in the way we program today. I mean, honestly, like her ideas were so advanced in that she really understood that people were going to be using this and not just like mathematics professors at universities, at Ivy League universities. I think it takes a really special mind to be able to see into something as abstract as technology, especially when you're as early as like my hottie is the most recent out of all of them. And he was born in 1938 and he's the most recent person in history. So like to go back and to have so little information, but still be able to see what could be and piece that together. I think in the realm of attractiveness, it's like all mental attractiveness. It's yeah. 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 That she could predict that we would live in a world where everybody literally has a computer in their pockets. Right. Exactly. And, and she, not only did she just predict that she fought for it. She was, she was told like, Oh, that's not a thing that 
is possible. Yeah. Because computers don't understand English. And she was like, yeah, but we could, we can make them understand English. Yeah. And that is just so mind blowing <laughs> for the 1940s. Yeah, totally. Definitely. I mean, yeah, I agree geez, with Whitney. Yeah. I give them all a five across the board yep. for mental attractiveness. Okay, great. Agreed. Great. So, uh, physical attractiveness. Lindsay, go first. All right. Well, I think Ada was very physically attractive. She was very delicate. Everybody always talked about her ha- having inherited Lord Byron's mouth. So all of his friends always talked about they didn't really think he looked like she looked like him except for her mouth, which was apparently very expressive and moody like his. Um, but she has a very delicate face, bright blue eyes, which actually the only time Byron ever referenced her in a poem was talking about her eyes as a baby that were bright blue. But she's got a pointed chin and like a very straight nose. And I just think that there's there's a sense of humor about any picture you see of her that's very attractive. And she was also kind of notorious for flirting a lot with everybody, that she was very vivacious. And partially because she was born under such a haze of scandal, had kind of given up on caring about (laughs) scandal in regards to her, that if it was going to happen, she wasn't going to censor herself. She actually, the most famous picture of her that would come up when you, the portrait with her hair in the rules and the veil and everything that comes up on most things she actually hated it was way more frippery than she normally wore and she thought it was much too like girlish of a portrait of her um but i still think it shows she had this dainty ferocity that i find really attractive so okay um yeah no i mean i definitely like from a google image search she's definitely attractive i think she's got an unfortunately british chin um, you and the British set... chins. You keep downing all my hotties for their British chins. <laughs> Stop choosing British chin people. <laughs> um, but I, I think definitely outside of that, I totally agree. There's definitely like, even in that portrait, which she apparently hates, and I just learned that now, um, there's like a whimsy in her eyes that I think is very attractive. And any And as you scroll down further in the image search, like there's other like portraits and stuff of her that... All, Definitely all seem to have that same sort of like charm and just like, yeah, the whimsy, uh, which obviously she had to have had in person for it to carry through in a painting. Um, so I'm gonna give her a four. I think she's a babe, yeah, yeah, you do. I'm gonna go, I gotta give her like at least a four and a half because I, I don't know, eight is a babe. Look at her, I mean, four and a half, <laughs> uh, okay, yeah. okay, yeah. Lindsay, what's your vote? I I mean, I think she's a five. Great. I, I really like her. Okay. So my hottie is mm, a little bit of a goob. <laughs> he, like, if you, if you Google uh, Frank S. Green, he's not an unattractive man, but he is pretty lanky, pretty thick glasses, you know, um... A lot of the pictures that were taken of him were taken a little bit older, more into his career where he was more successful. But if you see a few of the younger ones, like, he's not an unattractive guy, but he's definitely not the most attractive guy I've ever seen. So um, I'm going to give him a three. Yeah, um, definitely a little bit of a nerd thing happening. Um. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like, when I say he's a little bit of a goob, I kind of mean he's a pretty goobery. Like, he looks like he fits in yeah. in Silicon yeah, Valley. Yeah. Like, I agree. I'd say three as well. I, I think that's a fair estimation. He's, you know, nice okay. looking, but he's, yeah. I agree with the three. Yeah. Okay, so. Yeah, so, uh, Grace, if you, if you look her up, there's a lot of pictures from uh, later in her naval career, so... Um, mm-hmm. cause you know, she was in the Navy for 40 years, <laughs> uh, so she, she got quite up in the years. Um, but you can also see a lot of her pictures from when she was young and, you know, she's a, I think the fact that she was determined to enlist in the Navy, despite the fact that she was 15 pounds underweight says a lot about her character. And also you can tell by the way, like she holds herself in these photos, like she's, she's confident, mm-hmm. um, and so, you know, she's, I don't think she's as much of a babe as Ada Lovelace, but I definitely think she is a confident woman and she knew what she was talking about. And you know what? 
That means a lot for me in terms of it whether does. I think someone's attractive or not. Um, it does. And she's <laughs> got a real uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg thing happening that really works for me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, her older pictures, it's like, mm, yeah, <laughs> I'm into that. <laughs> nice. Um, I'm going to vote for. Man. I, yeah. That's just what I was. Yeah, I yeah, think that's, that's a good. I, I think that's say. a good number. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I agree. Cool. Yeah. So um, would you like to start us off, Liz, with social impact? Uh, sure. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, just like I was saying in the mental attractiveness, she has had such a huge impact. I mean, not only just in computer science, but in terms of like influencing women in tech. I mean, she yeah. is a true hero in many senses of the word. I, I am not sure that computer science would be what it is today if it weren't for her achievements. Um, the fact that just in 2016, she was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by Obama. That really says a lot about her impact, I think. Yeah. But yeah, I, I, I really don't think that we would be at this point without her achievements in computer science. So I think her social impact is, is pretty, pretty major. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I'm voting a five. So Her fight to make computing accessible to everybody and the, her insistence that it should be in English so that everybody could use it, at least everybody who speaks English. <laughs> yeah, just the foresight of understanding how much use there could be for it in a personal context outside of military or science. Exactly. And, you know, not everyone who programs is an engineer or mathematician. So I think that has really had a big impact. I would say five as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think this category is going to shake out a lot like uh, mental attractiveness because. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, so the thing about mine is that in, in terms of revolutionary thinking and long-term impact, both Ada Lovelace and Grace have higher score than Frank Green. I think, Van Green was incredibly impactful in ways that are a little bit less easy to put your finger on because like, yeah, first of all, being one of the first black people in tech at all is a huge deal. He is in the Silicon Valley Engineering Hall of Fame, and he's one of the few black people at all in the Hall of Fame, but like with Hewlett and Packard and those kinds of people, he's absolutely like just hailed as one of the first black technologists at all breaking the color barrier in an industry like i said before that's still kind of hard to get into for people of color and women and all that kind of stuff so i definitely think he has a social impact and the fact that like his memory chip being the fastest and biggest at kind of changing how computers work up until this day i definitely think he has an impact but i don't think it's on the same level as like ada lovelace or or grace like i think he's i think he's a four and, and everyone else is a five is what i would score that's along the lines of where i think too he definitely gets points for the amount of work he's put into encouraging other minorities in tech yeah i mean donating 80 million dollars to women and people of color in technology is a huge deal to like get people into leadership and into tech roles Definitely not a social impact you want to minimize, but also not the same as being clairvoyant and like seeing into the future, <laughs> basically. Yeah, yeah. So I would agree with um, a four for Frank and fives for Ada and Grace. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm with you there, too. Grace had so much foresight, but everybody in computing sense has quoted Ada Lovelace's notes as being fundamental to their work, like Alan Turing drawing a straight line from her and Charles Babbage. So, I mean, I think just the title of being the first computer programmer mm -hmm. hundreds of years before there would even be a working computer is <laughs> worthy of a five. So, yeah, I would agree with those. Yeah. Okay, great. So now we're on to je ne sais quoi. Yeah. I, again, feel like my hottie is kind of the underdog of the pack here because, <laughs> you know, a lot of people talk about his, like, tech achievements in Silicon Valley. Not a lot of people talk about how great his personality was and that sort of indefinable something. I think he probably falls probably about a four for me, maybe a three and a half. 
Maybe I'll put three and a half for for my guy because he definitely seems like a Silicon Valley nerd and not necessarily full of je ne sais quoi that would like draw you to them. Where I think that the like confidence and determination of Grace versus the like charm and sort of wit and whimsy. Yeah. Yeah. The idea of like mixing poetry with computing still is hard for people to grasp. And so I definitely feel like when you compare just kind of -of run-of-the-mill Silicon Valley nerd to either of those two women, he kind of falls short. So I think I'm going to vote three and a half for my hottie, for je ne sais quoi. Yeah, um, I I think that that's a pretty fair rating. Uh, We've never fully decided whether we're using halves or not. (laughs) But we are this time. Okay, but So three and a half. I I will definitely give Frank that. You'll vote vote three and a half? Okay. Yeah, I think that's great. Yeah. I think it's a little bit higher than average because especially with the so, sort of social rights stuff, yeah. I definitely like three is run of the mill down the middle of the road. And I think it's a little bit more than that. But also I think personality wise, none of the stuff that I found in reading about him was about his personality. It was all about the work that he did. And I feel like when you read anything mm-hmm. about either of the your two picks, yeah. There's a lot of stuff about their personality and with all of the stuff that they accomplished. So, yeah. I, yeah. I, I mean, I think je ne sais quoi for me for both of your hotties is going to be five. Admiral Grace was known as Amazing Grace. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, she had a nickname, <laughs> like a well known nickname in the army or yeah. the navy. So that's pretty incredible. She is, totally. I, I do think, though, that Ada should get like. Like, I feel like I should be, like, not me, Grace should have, like, a four and a half just because Ada ha- just has that something that I feel like neither of the other two have. And I feel like I'm really bad at debate right now because I just... <laughs> you just like, argued down your so own. Yeah. yeah. I just argued down my own. Yeah. No, it's, <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's hard when they're all so good. But there is just something about Ada um, that is, I think, deserving of a five where... Ours may not be. Lindsay, what are your votes? I mean, I I agree with Liz uh, <laughs> in that I think she, you know, really had that indefinable something that drew people to her. She was magnetic and charismatic and feisty and a bunch of, so I definitely think she's a five. I think Grace is a very compelling person. I love the fact that, yeah, I mean, if you've got a nickname that you're that well known by in the Navy, who... The Navy is great, not known for being super whimsical, (laughs) saying something. And even just fun little things like the bug comes from her. Yeah, yeah. um, Yeah. So I definitely, I would say a four and a half if we're using half. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So then I have the numbers. And if any of you listening at home are following along, you may kind of have an inkling of who's in the lead now. But the winner is definitely Ada Lovelace with 58 points, just two points shy of Grace, who has 56 points, and trailing 46.5 points in third place is Frank Green. All right. Hey, these are all pretty high-ranking people, yeah. though. Those, those numbers are pretty big. Got... <laughs> yeah, I think everyone did a solid job here with their picks, but I think awesome. the winner's pretty clear, although it's a pretty, pretty tight race between Grace and Ada. So Maybe I should have fought more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're really helping me out there, Liz. You're welcome back on the show anytime you want. <laughs> but Ada is just so good. I mean, I actually thought of picking her, but I was like, yeah. yeah. going to pick her, I guess. <laughs> All right, so there we have it. Thanks, Liz, for being on the show. We appreciate you being our very first guest in Historical Hotties History. Yes, thank you. Of course. My pleasure. Coming in with a really strong pick for Hot. <laughs> and uh, feel free, listeners, to reach out on Twitter at Historically Hot and let us know who you think should have won. If there was any points that we missed or, or people that we missed, let us know. And thanks for listening. Bye. Bye. Can't regret my